So a science YouTube channel with 4.2 million subscribers made a video which completely misrepresents the underlying science, so I feel like I should put the record straight and go over what he got wrong, which is almost everything. So hello everyone, I'm That Chemist. I do in-depth science videos about various topics, but today we're going to be reviewing a video called Why Does This Powder Only Dissolve in Cold Water? by The Action Lab. So recently James, who's the creator of The Action Lab, made this video. And in this video, he tries to teach his concept where he refers to inverse solubility. Hey everyone, today I'm going to be showing you a chemical that has inverse solubility. And so he starts by dissolving sugar in water as an example of an endothermic process as it requires thermal energy to dissolve. We know that when you want to dissolve something, it helps to heat it up. The heat provides more energy to break the bonds of the solid so it can dissolve. For example, you can see that when the salt dissolves in water, it actually makes it colder. So this is just kosher salt. We call this an endothermic reaction, meaning it absorbs heat from the environment. The dissolution of sugar into water is a physical change. It's not a chemical change. If he had dissolved a salt into water like sodium chloride, you may consider that to be a chemical reaction as the salt is ionized into chloride and sodium ions. But whether or not this is chemical or physical was hotly debated in the Discord. You can let me know down below whether you consider the dissolution of salt into water is a chemical reaction, but I would lean towards it being a physical one. Now, the one reason I would say it has a chance of being considered a chemical one is because of hydration. So if you had a transition metal, for instance, transition metals can have water as a ligand. And when you have water as a ligand, you have a new chemical compound. At least if you're an inorganic chemist, you'd, you would consider that a new chemical compound. When we were talking about physical changes versus chemical changes, normally if we're talking about a chemical change, we'd call that a chemical reaction. But I think calling something a physical reaction isn't necessarily like a useful thing to do. So initially he tries to talk about reactions, quote unquote reactions, when what he's really talking about in his video is the dissolution of stuff into water, which I would consider a physical change. So later in the video, he dissolves calcium acetate in water. I have a solution of this calcium acetate dissolved in water here. But watch what happens when I heat it up. You can see some of the white powder forming, so it's undissolving as I heat it up. This is the cold one here, and you can see it's completely this white liquid. And then the hot one, you can see that there's this white solid forming on top here. And when this is done, it's very slightly exothermic, and he demonstrates this with a thermometer. But if I take this calcium acetate and dissolve it in water, it heats the water up, so it's exothermic. And so the interesting thing about calcium acetate is that as the solution gets hotter, the solubility of the salt tends to decrease, which is atypical. Most of the time you see increased solubility as stuff dissolves, but there are some examples. So his rationale in the video, which is completely wrong, is that because it's exothermic when it's dissolved, if you add heat, it becomes less soluble. The thing with endothermic reactions is that when you provide more heat, it makes the reaction go faster because it's wanting to absorb the heat. But with exothermic reactions, the opposite is true. When you provide more heat to the reaction, it actually slows the reaction down because the reaction's wanting to give off heat instead of absorbing it. But this is just completely wrong. This is not the correct reasoning at all. But this is what he says in the video. Near the end of this video, I'll explain to you why that does happen because I got to the bottom of it. He erroneously conflates that the decreasing solubility of calcium acetate in water is due to the fact that it's exothermic when it's dissolved. Well, these are two separate physical processes. So here I've actually recorded an example of a reaction which is exothermic and the solubility increases. So if you've ever worked with sodium hydroxide before, when sodium hydroxide is dissolved in water, it's exothermic. And not only is it exothermic, but sodium hydroxide has increasing solubility in water the hotter the solution gets. And not only that, the hotter the solution is, the more quickly it dissolves, the more exothermic it is, which you can see here as well. So there's many things that follow this principle. It doesn't just involve mixing solids, right? You can mix liquids and sometimes that's exothermic, but you could still have increasing solubility depending on the temperatures. The reason this happens has to do with whether or not the solid naturally releases heat or absorbs heat when it dissolves. His explanation is just completely bogus. So another example that he gives to support his argument is the dissolution of gases in water, which he claims is always exothermic. What happened here with the calcium acetate is rare for solids, but it's actually the norm for gases. When you dissolve gases in water, it's exothermic. 
So that means that the hotter your water is, the less gas can dissolve in your liquid. So one thing that James is right about is that most gases will decrease their solubility in water. As the temperature tends to increase, the solubility tends to decrease. I'll show a couple examples of that on screen now. But the reason that their solubility decreases isn't because they're exothermic when they are dissolved in water, but rather because they follow something called Henry's Law. If you're interested in reading the original paper from Henry, I'll put a link to that paper in the description. So yes, the solubility of gases does decrease as the temperature increases, but it doesn't have anything to do with the gases being exothermic when they're added to water. Nonetheless, I decided it would be worthwhile to see how exothermic it would be to add carbon dioxide to water. I decided to test this myself because this is a really straightforward reaction to test. And I'm not sure why James from the Action Lab didn't just test this himself because it's really easy to do. I don't have chemicals at home. I uh, do have baking soda and vinegar, so I was able to make myself some CO2. And so I put it into a balloon and I bubble it through the solution. Here you can see that even though it's dissolving, there's essentially no detectable change in temperature, and that's because it's barely an exothermic process. So I decided to ask Sam, also known as Chemiolus, to test this out and see if he could get the CO2 to increase the temperature of the water. So he tried this as well. He gave it a good college try and there was a no temperature change observed. So if there is any temperature increase, it's super nuanced. And so James goes further to claim that the reason gases aren't soluble in water is because the same principle. So he says, because the dissolution of gases in water is exothermic, therefore the solubility of gases in water decreases as the temperature increases. But again, these are two separate processes. These are not correlated. So that's why hot soda releases so much more CO2 quickly than cold soda. So there is something involved here called entropy. And what happens is, as you heat chemicals up, sometimes an equilibrium can shift. So the idea of an equilibrium is that stuff shifts from the left to the right, and the flux through that equilibrium will increase as the temperature increases. And generally speaking, the equilibrium between the left and the right-hand side of that equation will increase as the temperature increases. However, where the equilibrium lies will shift depending on the temperature as well. So we're not just considering the flux between the products and the reactants. We're also considering what the predominant composition of the mixture will be. Will it be more reactants or will it be more products? Oftentimes, if you increase the temperature as well, additional reactions can take place. And so if other reactions are taking place, maybe that will also affect the equilibrium. So he uses the example of CO2 and water to illustrate his point where he claims that because CO2 dissolved in water is exothermic, therefore it's gonna be less soluble as the temperature increases. But the additional issue here is that CO2 actually forms carbonic acid to some extent when dissolved in water. So it's not an ideal gas. And so this is another poor example to try and illustrate his point. So I found this video extremely frustrating. There are some examples where when heated to a sufficiently high temperature, a reaction will revert from a favorable reaction to the reverse reaction. But it might be before you hit that temperature, which is called the ceiling temperature in the case of polymerization, that the forward reaction could still increase as it's heated. One example of this is a polymerization. So if you do a polymerization with polystyrene, it'll be lower at a lower temperature, it'll be higher at a higher temperature. However, if the polystyrene is exceeded past its ceiling temperature, you will start having a mixture of polymer and monomer. You will have other decomposition products forming, but you have the equilibrium between polymer and monomer. So you can have cases where the temperature is so high that the reaction will actually favor the starting materials over the products, but that's relatively uncommon. And so in the case of depolymerization, there's this great video from Chad who has the channel Thigh Labs, also known as Thizoid. He demonstrates that you can distill off styrene. Another example is the synthesis of cesium from sodium metal. You can also do it from lithium, although lithium has a slightly higher redox potential. So you could argue that this one's already entropically favorable to go to cesium. And the way that they're able to remove the cesium is through distillation, because cesium has a lower boiling point than sodium or lithium. And in the case of the distillation of cesium from lithium and cesium chloride, this has been demonstrated by Cody's lab, but it's also been demonstrated by Nicholas from Advanced Tinkering. And I'll include a link to both of those videos in the description. So in the case of converting lithium or sodium into cesium through the use of cesium chloride as a salt, the removal of cesium through distillation, that is using Le Chatelier's principle. Although in the case of adding heat to a reaction to try and drive it in the reverse order, that does not have to do with Le Chatelier's principle. It has to do with changing which side of the equation is entropically favorable, if it's a reaction. In the case of dissolution, it's more complex. It's commonly known that many salts when in water form hydrates to varying degrees. These haven't been studied a ton, but for example, for sodium hydroxide, several are known. You can see as the temperature increases, the number of water molecules that can hydrate the sodium hydroxide decreases because they become unstable. 
even sodium hydroxide in a low hydrate form is able to still be soluble in water. However, this is not the case for calcium acetate. So calcium acetate also forms hydrates. Now these may not be as stable at higher temperatures. And here's some data from a paper illustrating this. Here you can see that the monohydrate of calcium acetate decomposes above a certain temperature. And as it gets hotter and hotter, you tend to form the semi-hydrate. And the semi-hydrate is fairly stable up to higher temperatures. These are also just isolated salts, but there's other hydrate salts that exist in solution. And so the dihydrate is known, for example. And so what's actually happening here, as the calcium acetate hydrate is precipitating out of solution, it's because the lower order hydrates, such as the hydrate or the semi-hydrate, have lower solubility in water. So while James from the Action Lab claims, the hotter the water gets, the less calcium acetate it can hold. The water can actually hold less calcium acetate when it's hot than when it's cold. It's actually the reverse of that. The hotter the calcium acetate gets, the less water it can hold. And because the calcium acetate can hold less water, that salt is less soluble in the water. So I just wanted to correct any misinformation that he's put out there. If you have any other comments or if you think I got anything wrong here, I'd encourage you to put comments down below and I'll pin the most relevant comment. And if you ever see any other videos like this you'd like me to comment on, I'd encourage you to send them to me. Talking about science is good and it inspires people, but it's our responsibility as creators to spread accurate information. Thanks for watching and I hope you have a great day. Why would this happen? So obviously heating it up makes things dissolve easier.